Um, thank you guys for being here. Um, I just want to introduce, I guess, my panel. Um, first, we have uh, Danielle Azule uh, with L'Oreal. Uh, she's the head of uh, CSR and sustainability for L'Oreal USA. As part of her role, she oversees the implementation of L'Oreal's global sustainability program, Sharing Beauty with All, which addresses environmental and social impacts across L'Oreal's supply value chain. Um, next up, we have Carmina Mansanon. Um, Carmina is, uh, is completing a joint degree program at Yale with the School of Management and the Jackson Institute, and is currently part of KKR's global macro group. Uh, KKR is a global investment group. Her experience lies in the intersection of entrepreneurship and, economic, and financial policy in relationship to economic de development. Uh, in 2010, she presented Stitch Tomorrow, a sustainable social enterprise she co-founded at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Um, we also have Carla Martinez, the editor-in-chief of Vogue Mexico. Uh, she's been the editor-in-chief of Vogue Mexico since 2016, shortly after being appointed associate editor. Uh, Carla is uh, previously held fashion director and fashion editor and director post at Vogue USA, the New York Times T Magazine, and um, an interview in W Magazine. Um, and finally, we have Cress Welling, Wes, sorry, woo, Cress Wesling, co-founder and director of Elvis and Cress. Um, Cress is an award-winning environmental entrepreneur, young global leader and co-founder of Elvis and Cress, a company that turns industrial waste into lifestyle products and returns 50% of profits to charities. The company's first line is made from decommissioned fire hoses, and the profits from this line are donated to the firefighters' charity. The company now collects different, 12 different waste streams and, several, and has several charitable partnerships, as well as collaborations across industries. Um, thank you guys for being with us. Thanks thank for having us. Um, and so I guess the very first question that I have for um, the panel is sort of what do we think of the framing or the positioning of this panel, you know, green as a new luxury or green as a new gold? Um, I can start uh, from L'Oreal's perspective. Of course, we do make uh, luxury products, but we also make products for the mass market. And um, our approach is that no matter who you are, you should be able to afford sustainable products. And so we're not necessarily creating sustainability just as a um, niche, to fill a niche market, um, but really it's a new way of doing business for us and we're undergoing a huge transformation right now to ensure that um, you know, we're taking into account things like uh, raw material cultivation and energy use and water stewardship, um, not just necessarily what's in the product at the end, end use. So, um, yeah. um, sorry. <laughs> but we, we had a great discussion about this backstage, actually, and what, what we all, I think, agreed on is that green is not a trend. So we, we also hear things like green is the new black, and actually green is it. If we're not going to be green, then there is no future at all. So it can't be a trend, and it can't be something that we talk about briefly and then move on to something else. It does have to be how you structure your entire business, and it does have to go way beyond luxury and spread across industry. Green basically has to be it. Very much in line with that. I think when, when you think about the word sustainability, uh, the easiest word to associate with it is, is being green, being environmentally sustainable. But as my previous panelists also mentioned, um, being sustainable isn't, isn't just the environmental component. I think for millennials, this is all the more relevant um, as consuming for us what we wear, uh, what, we, what we drive with, um, and, and what, we, what we watch. It tells, tells a larger story about ourselves, our lifestyle, and so it's, it's not just about um, being environmentally sustainable, but across di different parts of the supply chain, uh, whether that's the manufacturing, the materials, uh, the labor that you're using um, when you talk about sustainability. I think from a media perspective, we have these, you know, you see these issues that are the green issue or the sustainability issue, but I think really it's our responsibility to talk about this and really to, to educate our cons the consumers and the readers that this is so much more than just as everyone said you know a trend it's it's not a trend it's really it's designers should be thinking about it 
um, media should be thinking about it and we should be talking about it as something that's imperative in our industry, especially in the fashion industry that's, that's extreme, one of the most wasteful industries um, yes, um, around. So I think it's something that, that we need to address and, and constantly just you know, remind ourselves of on a, on a daily basis. Um, I, before we move on to sort of a, a separate question that I had, which is sort of about like women and the role of women in sustainability and why, as a forum in women, why it's so important. Um, one question that sort of um, I think bubbled up when we were talking earlier is like, can we kind of make it a little bit more concrete in terms of sort of the waste and like the, the lack of sustainability in a lot of consumer products that maybe people aren't necessarily aware of? We know that fashion is the second most polluting industry in the world after oil and gas. So it, it's in a hugely unsustainable industry. And that has a lot to do with the supply chain, the use of water, the use of chemicals, but also um, an addiction that we have to overconsumption. Because we're, we're, we're given this idea that we need to have something new for spring, summer, winter, and fall. Um, and actually, I, I make belts that last a lifetime, so they really are <laughs> season three. But I, I, I think we have to look at every aspect of what goes into all of the products that we use and how everyone is treated across the supply chain. And that goes for packaging as well. It's not, there's so many issues that come into our consumer goods and we're not asking all of those questions, which is why a brand like L'Oreal is talking about the whole supply chain because that's what you have to be looking at. We have a... Um uh, uh, commitment to reduce our waste by 60% in our operations by 2020. Um, currently in the U.S., our facilities are zero waste to landfill. Um, our products integrate uh, post-consumer recycled content into each one of our products. And we made a, a commitment at Davos that by 2025, 100% of our products will either be uh, contain recycled content, be recyclable, rechargeable, refillable. So waste is something that we're extremely mindful of, um, whether or not that's being driven from the consumer uh, perspective. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, I went to the <coughs> natural, um, natural Products Expo last fall, and I went up to some of the, uh, uh, these wonderful, you know, across food and, um, and personal care products, and um, I would ask the vendors about their packaging, and, um, and or I'd identify, you know, I'd say, this isn't, you know, this isn't recyclable because it's shrink-wrapped, or this color or size isn't uh, recyclable, and it's, it was a reinforcement to me that really when even small companies are coming out with what they are, are considering natural products that really only speaks to the formulation, not the entire product, not the holistic approach. Um, so I think that's it's something that we all need to be more aware of. Um, and yeah, circling back as a forum, you know, focused on women, what are what are you what is the role of why is sustainability concern for or especially from a, a women's perspective? Um, I can speak to a few ways. I think um, the, the area of sustainability when it comes to consumption, not just in fashion, but in other, other areas as well, is so ripe for innovation. And I think when you have a space that is ripe for innovation, that's a space that women can really take leadership roles and be in the same playing field, be at the same table as men are. Um, and I can speak from uh, experience, at least in the fashion industry. Um, a few years ago, I founded an organization um, called the Sustainable Fashion Initiative, which is an organization that educates uh, college campuses and, and women um, who, are, who are younger on where their clothing is coming from and what it means. Um, and initially, um, how we were able to get these women interested was by alluring them with the glitz and glamour fashion. We had fashion shows and, and girls would, would attend and they were curious about, you know, what, what makes this fashion show happen. Um, but we also, uh, we also paired this fashion show with more educational components of workshops, uh, speaking with girls about how, where their materials are coming from, what's the labor being used for this. And so the girls that initially came to this organization because they were interested in, in the glamorous component of it, 
um, actually ended up being empowered and starting their own organizations. So we had some girls in our organization um, founded their own, their own social enterprise. Uh, one social enterprise is called DEA, which is a sustainable fashion initiative as well. Um, they source materials from all over the world and make these beautiful dresses um, and accessories. And there are some other girls that actually started their own magazine um, called Verte. Uh, and this, this was their way of being also an ambassador um, of, um, of sustainability and, and propagating this forward. And uh, more on the being on the same playing field as men um, and getting them involved in the conversation. Um, you mentioned earlier, I um, founded an organization that I pitched at Davos. Um, and in the beginning, a lot of the input that I was getting um, for the startup where it was coming from women in terms of design, in terms of even just mentorship about what it means to be um, a young female entrepreneur. But when I got to Davos, a lot of um, the people that were interested in the financial component of it were, were investors, and a lot of the investment landscape, now being um, in the more finance sphere, I understand are very, very male dominated. So the people that were coming up to me in Davos were men interested in this space. So it just creates a very, um, a very conducive conversation of multiple genders um, and multiple possibilities for where women can actually step up and take leadership roles. I think as women being um, primary consumers of, of fashion, and I think there we can really stand to, as you said, be on the same playing field as men and make decisions. And a few, um, last year, um, as Vogue Mexico and Latin America, we were invited to participate in a summit called Omina that's um, based in Costa Rica, founded by women. Um, Olivia Firth is on the board. It's founded by a woman named Andrea Soma and Carmen Busquets, who um, was one of the co-founders of Neta Porte. And um, she is now dedicating, you know, she's on the board for Rent the Rent for Armarium, which is a company that rents clothes. And it's this idea that, that you have to give back and that we have to know where our clothing is coming from. Just this week, you know, as we were saying, Kate Blanchett wore the same dress that she wore to the Golden Globes to Cannes. And then, you know, just really educating women, young women especially, you know, 16-year-olds that are looking on Instagram and they're seeing, you know, that women are wearing, you know, a new outfit every day and, you know, God forbid they can't wear the same outfit twice. And I think that that's just such... It, it, it was okay for, or not even, I mean, in my eyes, it wasn't okay, you know, for a year. But now I think we really have to re-educate people. It is okay to wear your clothes twice. It's better, you know, in the age of fast fashion, people want like, a new outfit for every day. But really, we should be promoting and wearing things that are well-made and we know where they come from, especially. And um, I think that, you know, just the state the statement that Kate Blanchett made this week it was it was really great just you know so that people these gowns that they're wearing that were made by women you know by women in Paris that have been you know doing this métier for all for all their lives um, I think it's important that she can wear this dress again and that you know we tell people that it's okay and I think part of the part of our job in media is to educate women to this I think also one of the biggest things is that we know women make most of the consumer choices in a household. And the reality of that, if you're thinking about what the influence or the impact of your decision is, is that you will naturally want that, that choice to help other people and not to hinder other people. And we have um, a saying in our business that if, if it doesn't make the world better for other people's grandchildren, we don't do it. So that's where, where any new idea fails, if, if it's not going to make the world better for other people's grandchildren. And that includes you know, buying a product that you don't know where it's made, you don't know who made it, you don't know if they were paid well, you don't know if the farmer was paid well, you don't know what kind of chemistry was involved. You, know, you have to think, I know that these are complicated choices and they're difficult to make when you've got a lot of other things to do, but I guess it sort of boils down to something that, that, it, that might make it easier uh, if someone is taking a hit somewhere, do you really want to wear it? Do you want that to be a part of the narrative that you tell? And women are fantastic at telling stories. So we need to empower them to have positive stories that are about helping other women and making the world generally better for everyone. Um, another point is that we know that uh, women in developing, women and girls in developing countries are going to bear the brunt of uh, changes from climate change. Um, and our mission at L'Oreal is beauty for all. Um, and we feel that we have to take these steps to ensure that we're protecting women everywhere. You know, um, it's it, from, 
from the um, cultivators of our key raw material ingredients in developing countries all over the world, to the people who work in our uh, facilities and factories uh, or offices, to the people who consume our products. And of course, our products are primarily consumed by women. Um, we know that from the data that women are not gonna stop buying these products. Um, and so it's up to, uh, up to us to ensure that the products are inherently sustainable. Um, that brings up the question of what are you guys hearing from your consumer from consumers about sustainability and what they're looking for in products, and um, are we seeing is there any sort of like in a generational divide? Like are younger people asking for different things than older women? I think things are definitely shifting. Um, so in uh, a, the, just this past April, a month ago, Influencer put out the Green Beauty Insights report, um, and what we the the data that we have is 78% of people surveyed, of women surveyed, um, say they have purchased a natural or organic personal care product within the last year. 66% um, of them have said that uh, they've purchased more than one. Um, just in the natural makeup uh, category, uh, there was a 9.8% growth last year, which was actually the fastest growing category in makeup was the naturals. Um, and then it's estimated by 2026 that 50% of the global makeup market will be in the naturals or organic uh, category. Um, so for sure, there is a shift. Um, whether or not we can see it as generational um, is to be determined because there is this segment, market segment of corp consumers that is actually intergenerational of people who just have this, um, uh, you know, they have a consumer ethic that they want to uh, support companies who are, and ensure that their products are, are doing the right thing. So the, the data is pretty clear. Yeah, one of the things, one of the things that I've noticed, um, I was buying nail polish for the first time in forever and I was looking for, this is so gonna out me, I was looking for like five free nail polish and I thought I was gonna have to go in this like very, five free is like there are like five chemicals in a lot of nail polish, or there used to be these five chemicals in nail polish that aren't great for personal health, um, their endocrine disruptors, and so I thought I was gonna have to like go to a specialty store or do all of this work, and so I'm in like the drugstore with my phone trying to figure out if I can find one. And they were like all <laughs> by free. It was like, it wasn't like, it wasn't like a natural brand, all of like the sort of standard nail polish sure. brands, and it seems like there is a shift at least on the chemical side. There's, there's certain things that are just perceived as table stakes now that 10 years ago may not have been the case, or there are, so what we're finding actually is that when we review our product portfolio, there are many products in there that would qualify as, you know, in this sort of uh, naturals category that aren't necessarily being marketed as such. And I think that speaks to sort of uh, inherent processes of companies and ensuring that this part of an ethos and part of the DNA of a company, um, because then it spreads far and wide and it's not necessarily um, driven by a consumer demand, but because it's the right thing to do. I think we've experienced, you know, we started in 2005, and when we began, a lot of people thought we were insane. Even the fire service, when we said we were going to give them half of our profits, they thought they would never see anything from us ever. Um, but what we found over the years is that there is an increasing group of conscious consumers, and these are people that take a long time to make a decision, and then when they make that decision, this is something that they really believe in, they really want to support, and they really want to have for a long time, which is why it's important for us to make things that have uh, uh, unbelievable longevity. I got an email last night from someone who said, you know, you have a terrible business model because I have two of your bags, and they're going to last forever, and I'll never need to buy another one. But actually, we sent this to the whole team because that's a victory for us. You know, you, I don't think you need to replace a bag very often actually, not when they last 20, 50 years, some of them, especially if you go online and you can see some of these amazing vintage pieces. And it's important that we repair and keep these things in service as long as possible. And we thought of that as our own set of values, but now we find that increasingly this is what consumers want. And they also want to, to walk into your workshop, to meet your team. They, they really crave this transparency. So last, I think it was a few weeks ago, there was Fashion Revolution Week, which was Fashion Revolution is a global campaign that started after Rana Plaza, which was a collapse of a fashion, fast fashion factory in Bangladesh. And 
what you do as a part of Fashion Revolution Week is you open your studio. And actually, I thought all of the brands would want to do this, would want to open their studios, open their workshops, and share all of their processes and let everyone meet their teams. And actually, very few brands sign up to this. In the UK, I think it was ourselves, uh, Stella McCartney, Vivian Westwood, but it was, it was a small group of people that you would expect to do this. And actually, we need this, this openness to be uh, much more widespread. The generational gap that you mentioned, I think, is, is really important um, to understand the differences and perhaps shift in these, in these behaviors. I mean, just in terms of statistics, right now about 30% of luxury consumers come from the millennial Gen X segment, um, and in 2025 it's projected to be 45%. And if you think about how, how these millennials are communicating their story through, through wh whatever they wear, whatever um, they're eating, it's through technology, it's through social media. Um, and so it's, it's a different playing field of not just being able to physically see what the other person is wearing in person, but the, the types of stories and what you're able to communicate about what you're purchasing is just done in a much deeper level if it's done um, on a technology platform. Um, and by the way, it's interesting to also think about where globally this is happening. Um, yes, on, on one hand, um, you have the Western consumers on technology, but you also have huge, um, huge technological literacy in emerging markets. And so when you think about where um, the wealth is spreading around the world and where that wealth is going, it's not just going to be looking at what what people are wearing or what people are purchasing that's physical and tangible, but even the experiences that they're having. Um, on Instagram, you're, you might take a picture of your dress and say, this great story about how it's from a sustainable fashion brand, but at the same time, you might also be able to talk about that dish that you ate that was farm to table, more sustainable, or that vacation you went to um, that was at this eco hotel, um, and there's much more opportunity um, in being able to be a sustainable player. I think this questioning from new, the new millennial generation has even gotten big companies like Gucci, Michael Kors, Versace that just this year announced that they were not going to work with fur products anymore. Um, you know, I think that's a huge milestone for, for a lot of these brands that you know, Michael Kors had an entire collection at one point that was based around uh, furs that they were you know, furs that they sold to their customers. I mean, their customers went to Michael Kors to buy furs. And um, I think that's a really big statement and it's, I think, Part of it is due to, to millennials and the consumers just asking, you know, what are you doing to, to be more sustainable and what are you doing to be a little more conscious about where our, the products are coming from? Um, something else Carmina touched on, which is like the rise of social. Um, I've heard anecdotally that one of the big things with young people on social media is that um, young people are shifting away from goods to experiences. And sort of how does that play out in terms of like a buying products, but also how does it play into like whether or not those experiences are sustainable? Well, we, we've we designed a system. Our latest range is based on rescued leather. So every year, 800,000 tons of leather offcuts goes to the cutting room floor and then generally is incinerated or landfilled. And we decided not to design products with this leather. We decided to come up with a system, a Lego-like system, that allows you to invent something with the leather and then reinvent it through time. So it's a kind of a circular economy product because you can make it and remake it. And it lends itself really well to experiences because we have people coming to our site to do workshops where they effectively design and build their own bags. And we know that when someone is engaged in the production or the co-creation of a product, its chance of having a longer life is automatically 20 to 30 percent better. So this, this idea of an experience is actually really profound because you're learning, you're, when people are in this workshop, they're learning not just about how to make a bag, but about 800,000 ton a year leather problem and how 50 percent of that profit for us goes to renewable energy projects. And it's a real chance to engage with all of the other issues about sustainability and a sustainable life and something that should be celebrated and aspirational and wonderful. But we, we, we think it's really important to have experiences, not just because that's the trend, but that's also the best way to really share positive sustainability stories that can then change the landscape of aspiration. I think that's luxury in general, right? Is like, is more about selling an experience than actually selling a product because it's with these, enormous price points, you are, it, you're building this sort of construct of what this product represents um, versus just a, 
a regular handbag, you know. And so, um, so I think that definitely there is something to that, and companies, consumer products companies are now competing with, um, you know, eco vacations and uh, things like that to, to actually um, sell their products. And I think that's something that everyone needs to also be mindful of. And when you link social media and experiences, um, you have to ask yourself also where where are these young people and, and even just social media users getting their ideas of what are good experiences and what are bad experiences. And while there, of course, are still advertisements, there are still spokespeople. Now the idea of a role model has shifted in many ways in being the um, the thought leaders of, of people who are producing perhaps the most or compelling YouTube videos or have really interesting blog posts. So where they get their idea is is also um, shifting in many. Cool. So we've been throwing around the terms green and sustainability, but we actually haven't defined them. So how do you guys define like what is green or what is sustainable? So for us, we take the traditional um, 3P pillar approach um, where we are looking at a balance for people, planet, and profit, and, every, and integrating that mindset into every business decision we make uh, to ensure that the negative externalities that are created just from our day-to-day -day business decisions are proactively managed. Um, and so that's how, that's what that means to us. Um, but, you know, the, certainly among consumers and the external world, um, there is no aligned definition, especially around what, what is natural products? What, what is that? That's something different to everybody, something different to every company, especially companies that are even saying that they're natural companies, you know, so at some point we will have to align around what these terms actually mean. Uh, very much agreed. I think especially for better or for worse, millennials tend to be quite um, critical and argumentative. And I wish there could be a certification that says, you know, USDA organic, USDA sustainable. But I think there's a lot of criticism that, um, that even brands that mark themselves as sustainable um, can, can encounter. Uh, for instance, even if you think about Tom's, their buy one, give one aspect of buying a pair of Tom's shoes, giving it out, um, at first glance seemed like a great idea until all of these um, bloggers and, and sustainable um, sustainability leaders started questioning, you know, is that really sustainable? Is what they're doing um, having a good long-term impact? Um, and so I think the, the beauty about your question is that there's a lot of um, arguments and it's, it's a place with a lot of growth um, and it's, it is up to the consumer and each person as to what they decide. I think as everyone said, the, the, in fashion it can be a bit of a blurry line. I think, you know, one of the most important brands that started this um, trend was Stella McCartney, or not, I shouldn't use the word trend, but Stella McCartney, you know, actively decided not to use leather products. Um, a lot of brands had followed suit. I remember a lot of the invites to her shows are made with recycled paper and recycled items and things that you can use again. And I think that, you know, most companies now, there is some, I think all brands are, are trying to jump on this idea because exactly people are questioning, you know, where they're coming from. But I think in my opinion as a consumer, you know, when I when I buy something, I try and find as much as I can in terms of clothing and fashion. You do I, I am more conscious about sustainability and about how, you know, the the fabric and where it's made and just questioning a bit more. And I think that's part of the conversation. It, but for us, sustainable is always easier to define when you look at the opposite. So if you actually Google unsustainable, um, the, the first definition that often pops up is that it's something that can't be maintained in the long term. And the next word, which I absolutely love, is indefensible. So you, you have to think, do you really want to be part of a unmaintainable, indefensible industry? Because that's really how most of the world is currently run. And then we built our business, um, and, and I think it was much easier for Elvis and I to build a business in the way that we have because we started from scratch. You know, we weren't trying to fight against the system, we were trying to reinvent the system. And for us, that meant looking at, yes, people, planet, profit, but essentially starting with a problem. You know, we didn't have an idea actually to go into luxury at all. We wanted to solve London's decommissioned fire hose waste problem. And we knew if we solved that in an engaging, way that we would have a chance of redefining what waste is. And now, you know, we've, we've rescued hundreds of tons of material and made um, thousands and thousands of pounds worth of donations. But in the meantime, we're also a 
B Corp, like Ben & Jerry's is a B Corp, Patagonia is a B Corp. It's a high level of certification according to all of the things that we're discussing. Um, we're also a social enterprise, which means that we're basically de designed to give back and to be good. And it, it's much easier for us to have built our business that way because we didn't have um, a starting point or a legacy to contend with, which is what makes it so great for innovation now because you can really rewrite the rules from now. And I think that's something that's unique when you talk about global corporations who have been making products for decades or you know well, over a hundred of hundreds of years. Like you have the ability to really make an impact at scale. So what Cressy's doing is amazing because she's providing a new way to look at the world. And what we're trying to do is really use our day-to-day -day decisions to create positive impact um, across our value chain and, and across the globe. I want to go back to an idea that Cressy was talking about before, which is um, transparency. I think there's really three key ideas around sustainability, which are transparency, traceability, and accountability. And um, those to me are like the three key ingredients um, that any, any company needs to, to really be considered sustainable. Okay, so I'm going to ask the panel um, one more question before I open up to the audience for questions. Um, so start thinking about your questions. Okay. <laughs> um, and so um, from a consumer perspective, how can consumers be sure that what they're purchasing is actually if not green, at least liter at least trying to make the efforts towards sustainability that is sort of embodied in what they may be saying on the package. Like, how do they know that they're not just falling for some greenwash? Well, I will say that when you work for uh, a, a company or when you buy products from a big global company, there are a lot of regulations in place. Um, and the... the um, Spotlight is certainly on these big companies uh, from a regulatory perspective and regulatory enforcement perspective. So from, and we are very, very conservative about what we are talking about. We've been doing this work since 2005 and we're just now starting to talk about it because we wanted to spend that time to build that credibility and, uh, and so that when we went public with our message, we knew what we were talking about and we hopefully are giving our um, consumers a, a reliable, incredible, and consistent message. Um, so I'll just try and open it up. Deciding whether something is sustainable, I think, is a two-way street. On the one hand, you should be able to find as much information as you can about what you're, what you're wearing, what you're eating, and be able to get those answers if you, if you are asking the questions. If you're not able to get the answers, then perhaps you can question why aren't you. And that might hint at perhaps unsustainable pro um, practices. At the same time though, it, it's up to the person themselves to try to understand like, from their perspective what is sustainability and fact check what they're, what they're hearing and whether that resonates with them. Yeah, I think a little bit of, of research. I mean, on, in my experience, I have two, uh, I have twin daughters and um, when, when shop, it, especially when they were, yet, were right now, when they're, they're two and a half, when we were buying, products, just, you know, shampoos and conditioners. And um, my sister sent me a list of, you know, all the companies and we did our research. And, you know, I live in Mexico where I, my mom grew up in a small town before we would go visit her. The milk was obviously organic. It came straight from the cow and, you know, everything was organic before. And, you know, with NAFTA and, and a lot of um, what happened with free trade is that we were influx in Mexico with products that, you know, came outside of Mexico that not necessarily were made there. So now I think what was most important to me is, is, is research and trying to find products. And a lot of, there are a lot of companies in Mexico, for example, that do things that are made in Mexico, clothing and cotton from, that some bring um, cottons from Peru and just trying to buy locally, which, which if you do your research, you know that, that, you know, they were, trans they were not coming from China, they were transported from Mexico, which makes a difference as well. And um, just trying to support local brands, I think, for me, that was, that was one of the most important things and, you know, buying in the country and, or, you know, from cottons from, from Peru um, that you know are more, that are more natural. So I think that was my experience and, and that worked for me in, in a, my thing. 
I think that the research is absolutely crucial. And part of the reason why we're a B Corp is because we want to make that research as easy as possible. We want to be as transparent as possible for people. But also, it, it is a two-way street in the sense that the best way to help me be a sustainable business is actually for, for you to buy less. Um, you know, it's okay to spend a lot of time researching a product and thinking about what you want to buy because that will help you to buy less and buy much, much better. And, and actually, you know, if you have a belt right now that, that you love, do not buy one of my belts. And, and I know this is sort of not what a head of a company that makes and sells things should say, but actually I only want to sell people a belt or a bag when the, their current favorite is no longer usable because it's destroyed. And even then, I'd rather you come to me and ask me to repair it before I sell you something that's new, even though my new products are made with 25-year-old vintage fire hoses and, and other reclaimed materials. It does have to be this relationship that we have over time. And I know that that takes effort, but that's the only way we're going to make things better for everyone. Cool, so do we have any questions from the audience? Hi. Good morning. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for sharing your thoughts on uh, sustainability in the fashion industry. Uh, my question is for Dania from L'Oreal. I wanted to touch on the concept of traceability and accountability within the supply chain, and I wanted you to share a little bit more about the power of collaboration within the beauty industry and the global giants like L'Oreal. What are you doing to increase traceability and accountability within the supply chain? Great, thank you. Um, we have a program called Solidarity Sourcing, um, which is um, where it's our goal, a global goal that we set for ourselves where we will uh, enable over 100,000 people worldwide that come from disadvantaged communities to gain access to work. Um, so what we've done is we've mapped our key raw material ingredients all over the world, whether it's shea butter in Burkina Faso or argan oil in Morocco, aloe in Mexico, and we partner with uh, local NGOs to develop small fo farmer cooperatives in the area, implement sustainable agriculture practices, um, and also um, follow some type of fair trade principles as well. So it's like our own internal um, fair trade type of better buying program, if you will. Um, but we believe that by really lifting people up, um, we, you know, we see these people as an extension of our own supply chain. Um, the, the work that they're doing in their farms is key for us to be able to make our, our products. And so that's just one example of the kind of work that we're trying to gain as much visibility as we can upstream. Hi there, thanks for a fabulous panel. Um, I, have a, I, I will lead into my question with a really, really mini short story, and it's sort of a UK-US mindset story. Um, so my husband, who is from the US, um, had a barber, and you know, the, the jacket, and um, he, it started to fray or whatever, the sleeves, as you know, barbers will eventually. Um, and uh, we were chatting to an, an English friend of ours, and he was commenting on the sleeves and how he would have to get rid of it and buy a new one. And naturally, she was horrified. And she said, nobody ever throws away a barber. You have it for life. Are you joking? What's wrong with you? And um, I think it sort of represents a bit of a mindset. Um, you know, in the, I, I don't mean to generalize, but I'm going to generalize. I think that the US mindset is really, you know, you use it, you get a hole in it, you throw it away, you buy a new one, it's always replaceable. And I think perhaps the British mindset is a little bit more of kind of, you keep it, you preserve it, you darn it, you sew the button back on. Um, that's a general, really generalization. So forgive me if it's, it's all off, but this is a sort of case study of my life. Um, and I'm curious, how do we go about changing the mindset of people when it's so much easier and it's so easy to buy something and replace it and just uh, the button falls off, forget it, it's done. You know, nobody knows, you know, it's too um, tiresome to sew something or care about it or put it back together. Um, so I, I sort of think about it from an American perspective, which is where I live. How do you make it easier or um, more wonderful to keep and pres preserve something. 
Well, I think this, this goes back to how you approach repairs. We make the repair process really enjoyable and really fun for everyone who, who's involved in it. You have to celebrate repairs. This is something that all of our grandparents' generation knew how to do, and we've somehow forgotten it in two generations, and we need to reacquire these skills. And we should be celebrating these skills. And it should be actually, in the previous, uh, one of the previous panels this morning, they were talking about how we need to work on both genders. And actually, maybe all young people of all genders should be taught how to sew a button back on in school. And it shouldn't just be a program like when I was in school, where it was, that was where the girls went for class for a half an hour a week. But we should know how to make, to fix things and it isn't just the US, UK. I mean, I've been in Mexico City where there's an entire street w which is devoted to repairs of products, of appliances. There was three shops that just fixed blenders, which I thought, gosh, these people really like their uh, blended juices and things like that. But we need to have more of that happening, specifically in countries where they're going the, maybe the, the, the other direction at the moment. When I, I lived in China in 1997, and you. You use, there used to be five bike repair shops on every single street. And they weren't really shops, they were just a guy with a bunch of tools. And that is disappearing now from, from Beijing and Shanghai. And people are switching to buying new bikes. And we have to really, really look at these terrible trends. Because actually, you know, having a repaired product should be the ultimate aspirational good. I thought you were going to say that in Mexico, you saw so much product and so much in Mexico, we call it fayuca. It's like the, the fake kind of t-shirts and, and products, and it's so overwhelming. And you drive in the street, you're like, who is buying this stuff? But um, now, I, I lived in the US for a really long time, and now I live in Mexico. I grew up on the border. And um, Mexico is very much like the US in that um, these younger generations just want new and new and new. And a lot of, you know, our parents' generation really wanted to have something and, and as you said, have it repaired. And there's, um, you know, you can have a dress, you can have your grandmother's dress fixed um, instantly. But I, I think it's, again, just a matter of educating people that you don't need um, the, 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 bar the barber jacket looks amazing when it's worn and used and, and you know, it's cooler that way. Um, but I really think that, that as media and just influencers in general, just we really need to stop this amount of stuff that is consumed and just thrown away. And I think um, part of our responsibility is to, you know, people that have influence and have really just educate people again that, that it's not about quantity, it's about quality. I think that's something that the luxury segment and even like the outdoor segment have in in common. Uh, quite a lot of lug, uh, of outdoor um, apparel companies like Patagonia, North Face, they all do uh, repairs and um, and so and Barber actually does repairs too. My husband has a Barber jacket. He sent it back a thousand times to be rewaxed and okay. sewn up. And and to be honest with you, all of those, you know, Nick's and repairs are what make that jacket unique and uniquely his and he can tell you sort of like oh this got ripped on this farm or when I was on this hike and um, it has a story to tell you know there's something really magical about that and it's yours um, it's your story um, other things that I think are I rent all my clothes. I rent my work clothes. This skirt is rented um, from Rent the Runway. And, and so I buy very little in terms of apparel. And I think that, you know, we're, the opportunities to do this are out there. As consumers, it's up to us to really seek them out and support the companies that are offering these opportunities um, because ultimately those products are going to, the longer you have like a good pair of jeans, you know, it's, uh, you can have it for decades and, and, uh, and, and it, it's yours. It fits your body perfectly. It's, it feels like home, you know, so. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to interject really quickly. Um, I think a point that we're maybe glossing over is that some things are not designed to be repair. So like try stitching up a tissue tee. Um, good luck. Um, and then there's like a wide range, there's actually several legislation in the United States for the right to repair. It's especially prominent in electronics, which aren't designed to be repaired. I, um, I cracked my laptop screen and they sent it out and they just replaced 
um, I was actually lucky, but they basically replaced half the computer, I think, because it was still under warranty. But the idea that you couldn't just like fix the screen was really um, insane to me. Um, and you know, we buy furniture now that's made out of particle board, so if it chips, good luck. You know, whereas wood furniture, it adds to the luster and it makes it more beautiful. Um, but it seems like the default are things that, like, even if you want to fit. I actually took a pair of shoes once to get them resold, and the cobbler laughed at me. <laughs> you know, he was like, you don't want to do that. Um, and so I think that that's also an element where it's sometimes it's getting increasingly harder to find things that even if you want to fix them, that you can get them fixed. I think in New York you can get any pairs of shoes no, fixed now. No, I mean, he literally, he was like, it's not worth it. He's like, I can do it, but, like, it's not a good idea. Yeah, actually, I mean, education certainly and... The, what you buy certainly. I think her question also relates to the, the entire theme of this um, of this panel, which is sustainability and, and, and luxury. And I think the um, something that we talked about backstage and a qualm that a lot of us had was um, what it means to be sustainable and how that relates to socioeconomic status. Uh, I remember when I was just starting to enter this um, this space and I was looking at you know how how what damage will it do to my wallet to buy something that's sustainable. I mean, if you're going to be paying the people who are constructing your clothing and constructing um, your materials more and you're taking that extra effort to find the materials that are better, the clothing that you're going to be wearing is probably going to cost more. So there is a price premium to be paid for this luxury. Um, and I think perhaps um, a question might be, what, what will it take for this to be a, an equal playing field for people from all socioeconomic status to be using these products that are, um, that are sustainable and not necessarily luxury priced? Maybe a key thing that we need to start integrating into the conversation about luxury or about sustainability is about durability. Um, because to your point, you know, how can something that is um, made of very, very delicate fabric or um, meant to be temporary even be considered sustainable? Um, and I feel like Cressy would probably agree with that sentiment maybe. Well, even, even if you look at sort of the, uh, the history of luxury brands, a lot of their brands were based on quality and longevity. You know, Hermes made saddles for the French military. And the reason why they became a big company is because their saddles were the best. And we have to, we, we do have to think about the, the reality of price. And I do get questioned a lot on the prices of my goods. But again, I have to come back to the point that um, nobody, I'm not, a, I'm not okay with anybody taking a hit in any of the goods that we make. That's not acceptable to me, and it's not acceptable in any of the clothing that I wear. And maybe actually that's where we have to think about being maybe a little bit less fashionable and being a bit more plain. You know, that's where I, why I often just wear black, and <laughs> it's very easy. No one's gonna notice if I wore this several times. And I, I think it's, it's kind of, we have to think about what we should celebrate. But it's also to your point that, you know, you buy less and you rent more, you know, when you have a special occasion and, and maybe you save the money and you buy a really great bag or, mm -hmm. or something. I think these new ideas make it possible to buy something that's a little, maybe a little more expensive, but you're not, because you're spending less on, on an evening dress that you might wear once a year. I think we have time for one more question. So I guess it's more of a follow-up question with the previous conversation that was happening, but it's more to do with the repair for cost versus the actual cost of an item. Um, what would be your response to that? Because I know that it's better to rent, and I know that it's better to go ahead and repair the item, but what if the cost to actually repair the item is almost the same as buying a new one? That it, if, if that's the case, then it's often because the product that was purchased in the first place was not ethically or environmentally made. And so if you go into, um, I hate to do this because I don't want to name any names, but if you go into many high street stores, you might find t-shirts that cost less than uh, $5. And if a t-shirt costs less than $5, there has been exploitation involved in that t-shirt. Exploitation of the farmer, the spinner, the cutter, the weaver. I mean, a sandwich is $5, come on. Um, an apple in some Whole Foods stores is $5. <laughs> and you have to question that. So of course it's gonna be more money to repair that $5 t-shirt than the cost of the t-shirt. Our bags 
top out at, I would say, um, I'm terrible at, um, they're in British pounds, 350 pounds, maybe $600, 500 and something dollars. And there is no way that the repair would ever cost anywhere near that because we just charge at cost the time for one of our highly skilled craftspeople. Um, so, so I think you, the, the, if the equation works that way, it means that the product was not worth buying in the first place. And that, that takes me back to maybe the raw material that we started with, you know. We collect fire hose because it's too damaged to repair. It's often 25 years old before it's had a catastrophic tear in it. This is beautiful vintage material with scars. It tells a story. And it's a heroic, life-saving material. And there's, there's no reason that, that, that it should languish in landfill. The reason that we put as much love and care into making the products as we do and we want to repair them is that it would be dishonorable for me to take something that was beautiful and wonderful and turn it into something cheap and irreparable. Thank you guys. And thank you guys for attending. <laughs>